I'll first give you a brief introduction about I'll first give you a brief introduction about the center and this initiative. Enactment of Insolvency Bankruptcy Code 2016 is the most robust economic reforms in India. It has brought a paradigm shift in creditors' protection, giving colossal power to creditors to steer the rescue of stressed companies. The code has adopted a truly market-centric approach for insolvency resolution. To support the government in this initiative, Center for Insolvency and Bankruptcy was established at the Indian Institute of Corporate Affairs for capacity building and action research in insolvency and related areas. It is the only one to offer first of its kind graduate insolvency program to develop the cadre of young insolvency professionals in India. Indian Institute of Corporate Affairs has been established by the Indian Ministry of Corporate Affairs for capacity building and training in various subjects and matters relevant to corporate regulation and governance. As an institute, we try to anticipate and meet needs of learners in a way no one else does. In wake of COVID-19, insolvency laws across globe need to rapidly adapt to change. It needs to re-emerge in a position of strength. Governments worldwide have been taking unprecedented measures to understand and explore countries' perspectives on insolvency laws across the globe and its impact on business, the Center for Insolvency and Bankruptcy has launched a series of web talks bringing together acclaimed oh. academicians to share insights on the measures adopted by countries while navigating to this new normal. Today, we have with us noted scholar and professor from the UK, Professor Rebecca Parry. Professor Parry is co-director for the Center for Business and Insolvency Laws at the Nottingham Trent University. Her main research interests lie in the area of insolvency laws and in particular international and comparative insolvency laws with focus on the UK, China, India, the USA and the EU. Professor Parry interest in related areas of company laws, notably directors' duties and director disqualification, as well as an insolvent partnership. In recent years, she has developed a strong interest in insolvencies with potentially large public impact, including cloud computing insolvencies. Welcome you, Professor Perry. Uh, thank you, Niki. Welcome, thank you. Welcome, everyone. Everyone. Um, as, um, the, as the uh, says, please can everybody mute their microphones? Uh, that will help me to um, deliver the presentation because otherwise I'm getting a, an echo that uh, makes it it's very distracting. So in the seminar today, I'm going to be looking at the UK insolvency regime and how it has had to adapt in the wake of the very significant disruption uh, caused by COVID-19. To give an overview of what I'll be looking at today, I think the starting point should always be how insolvencies are approached in normal times, because all the countries have designed systems that were put together with no anticipation of the disruption of the, the, the kind brought by COVID-19. And um, we'll look at how um, insolvencies tend to be approached in, in calmer circumstances. We'll then look at what briefly look at what the impact of COVID-19 has been in the, in the UK and how that has affected businesses. And then we'll look at the government response, briefly including the government financial response. But the main focus will be on the UK insolvency procedures and how they have been adapted. So when we look at insolvency law in more stable times, it's, it's quite noticeable that it's very different from the approach that has tended to be adopted in the wake of COVID-19. That the role of the state normally is quite limited in mature systems of insolvency law. The state provides laws that provide frameworks for the resolution of company difficulties. And 
within those frameworks, we tend to have a blend of governance mechanisms, some involvement from the courts, directors, creditors and insolvency practitioners, and the levels of involvement of each of those uh, means of governance will tend to vary depending on the system and in um, particular approaches and policies. And uh, there'll be limited state involvement that uh, it will tend to be for the market, in particular through creditors, to decide whether a restructuring plan is acceptable. And um, of course, in the wake of COVID-19, um, the existing systems are um, uh, having to adapt, including through measures to ensure that companies have enough finance to, um, to, to get through the, the, the current crisis and also enough protection to get through it. So, of course, the impact of COVID-19 has been um, throughout the world uh, significant so far as companies have been con concerned because formerly healthy companies that at the start of the year were doing very well indeed have suffered massive shocks due to the, the lockdown. Um, high street stores have had to close, uh, restaurants and, and, and pubs, etc., um, have, have lost all of their custom because customers just can't go to those um, those businesses. They've, they've had to um, had had to temporarily close due to the lockdown. And because of that, because of a loss of significant in, in income streams for formerly healthy companies. There have had to be significant efforts by the state to support companies during this time and a lot of uh, government investment in helping companies. Here's a brief timeline of the impact of COVID-19 in the UK. So it really started to hit towards the end of January when there was a recorded case and the number of cases has, grow has grown um, steadily since then, and it's only leveled out relatively recently. Uh, so from the start of March, there was a government plan announced, and that was envisaging different um, patterns for the impact of COVID-19. Um, importantly, on 11th of March, there was some reassurance to businesses because there was a government budget that announced 30 million pounds worth of measures that were designed to protect the economy from the impact of coronavirus. And I'll be looking briefly at those um, in, in a minute. On the, the 17th of March, as part of that, there was um, a scheme launched to uh, encourage the granting of finance for struggling companies. And that was where the, the government would uh, guarantee loans. On the, from the point of view of job preservation on the 20th of March, there was a coronavirus job retention scheme launched where the government would pay 80% of the wages of furloughed employees, that is employees who, due to the lockdown, are unable to do their jobs. And at the same time, there was a closure audit of pubs, restaurants, theatres, etc., places where there would be large gatherings of um, members of the public. And uh, three days later, the, the lockdown began. And uh, as a result of the, the lockdown, key workers such as uh, nurses can go to work, but um, everybody else has to stay at home and, um, and, and do their jobs if, if they can. So this has been the main, on, on the slide is the main message of the, the UK, stay at home, protect the NHS and, and save lives. So the, the aim has been to prevent the National Health Service from becoming overwhelmed by the numbers of um, COVID-19 cases. Um, the impact of these, uh, these measures, the lockdown, has of course been uh, very important to limit the impact of, of COVID-19, but it has had a major impact on the economy. And a quotation yesterday from a business economist 
um, was that business closures and social distancing measures have caused business activity to collapse at a rate vastly exceeding that seen even during the global financial crisis, confirming fears that GDP will slump to a degree previously thought unimaginable in the second quarter due to measures taken to contain the spread of the virus. So obviously the global financial crisis uh, had a major impact and um, this economist anticipating that the impact of COVID-19 will be even worse. So the institutions that we have and the insolvency procedures will become very important. They, they are already very important, but the importance will increase in, um, in the coming months. Now, generally, there have been a variety of approaches by governments, and I'll be looking at what the UK approach has been. Um, government approaches tend to consist of legal, economic and financial measures. And what I'll be focusing on are two, within that two uh, initiatives by the UK. That is the measures to support directors and also measures to support insolvency practitioners. One of the things that will help companies to get through the, um, the, the current crisis is the provision of uh, further financing. If companies are in difficulties in any circumstances, one of the factors that will improve their chances of recovering will be the availability of finance. And um, therefore, in the in, in current circumstances, state finance will be will be very important. So state finance can play an important part in helping viable companies to weather the, the shock caused by coronavirus. And um, one thing that hopefully should be avoided in the current scenario is the prolonging of the lives of companies that are not viable in any circumstances. So there'll be some companies that have entered insolvency proceedings during the current crisis, but which were inevitably going to enter insolvency proceedings anyway, and which, which were not viable candidates for survival. And um, arguably, the uh, funds should not be used to artificially prolong the lives of companies that are fundamentally flawed, that should, should be confined to companies which are viable. One problem is knowing the difference. And um, I think it's important rather than the state throwing money at every company that needs it, that there should be some uh, evaluation. And one way in which that can be achieved is through relying on existing lenders who will have experience and knowledge to assess the viability of companies. And um, therefore, I think it's important for private finance to play a role where possible so that you have that expertise brought in, but also so that the impact on the government purse is limited. When the financing is concerned, there are three main schemes in the UK and um, they vary depending on the size of the company. So the, at the top level, there's a COVID corporate financing facility where the government will buy investments in companies. And that is limited to those investment grade companies making material contribution to economic activity in the UK, so the highest profile companies that would be regarded as particularly viable will be given assistance through this scheme. And then there was a scheme announced for small and medium enterprises. Most companies in the UK are small and medium enterprises. They play a very significant role in the economy. 
and um, initially the focus was on them. So there was a coronavirus business interruption scheme launched that was limited to small and medium enterprises with an annual turnover of up to 45 million. And um, also it was felt that um, larger companies needed assistance as well. And so at a later point, there was um, announced a coronavirus large business interruption loan scheme, CLBIS. And that's for companies with an annual turnover of over 45 million. Now, what these latter two schemes offer is that if these companies obtain lending from um, private finance, then the government will guarantee those loans. Uh, initially, it was intended that those guarantees would only be available where companies could not obtain commercial lending on ordinary terms. But it was considered that that restriction could leave companies being forced to accept terms that were not the most favorable. And so that requirement has been uh, removed so that companies aren't obliged to accept um, unsatisfactory terms. Okay, so that's a, a bit of a background as to uh, the context, the impact that coronavirus has in the UK and an overview of what the state response has been. So the state is providing finance and that addresses part of the problem for struggling companies. But what we also need to look at is the UK insolvency procedures and how they will fare in helping companies to cope with coronavirus. Um, as mentioned in the, the comments, you, are, you can put your questions in the, um, in the chat facility and I will, uh, if uh, convenient, deal with them during the, um, during the session. Uh, so I'll, I'll be able to see those if, if you want to put your questions. The UK insolvency system is fairly complicated because there are a great many insolvency procedures, um, over 20, if you, if you can believe that. Now, some of those are aimed at particular sectors, so we don't need to, to consider those. And the main focus will be on three procedures. The main one of these is administration. Uh, administration is the most high profile of the UK insolvency procedures. It enables companies to obtain protection from the claims of creditors through a moratorium. So during the moratorium, creditors can't enforce their claims. They can't repossess goods that they've supplied they can't sue the company, they can't press for payment. That is unless they get permission from the insolvency practitioner or unless they get permission from the courts. So administration is and it designed as an important means of protection for struggling companies that enables these companies to gain the benefit of the morium while they figure out what to do. And um, so the um, so some of these questions that are coming through are quite specialised, and I think probably I'll, I'll I'll deal with those towards the end. Um, so so first of all, I, I can deal with the cross border insolvency uh, question, but um, procedures would be handled under the EU regulation, which is specifically designed to address the opening of proceedings and choice of jurisdiction and choice of law. So in the, the current circumstances, a company would file in the jurisdiction where it has its centre of main interests. And um, so 
during the, the current crisis, companies with their centre of main interest in the UK would be filing in the UK. And there has been some discussion at EU level as to appropriate responses and some of the measures that have been taken, for example, to protect directors have come as a result of EU level uh, discussions. So to return to administration. So this is a procedure that enables a company to gain the benefit of a moratorium. And it's a procedure which is modeled on administrative receivership originally. That is, uh, an insolvency practitioner will uh, take control of the company and will figure out what to do with it. And um, unlike administrative receivership, it's not directed towards satisfying the interests of one creditor. Rather, administration is a procedure that um, is designed so that uh, all creditors can benefit. It's not a procedure which is simply run in the interest of um, uh, a particular secured creditor. Um, so it's a, a procedure which is, revolves around insolvency practitioner control. And in 2002, an important, so far as the current situation is concerned, an important step was taken to limit the level of court involvement. So it used to be that you could only get an administration appointment if there was a court order. But it was considered that that added too much time and expense to the opening of insolvency procedures. So in 2002, the level of court involvement was uh, was reduced, and now you can get an administration appointment out of court, and um, the appointment is made through an insolvency practitioner scrutinising the um, application and. Um, providing an opinion on whether or not administration will bring desired benefits. And um, I think that makes administration a fairly uh, useful pr procedure in current circumstances, that it doesn't rely on a court decision. Obviously, the courts are suffering at the moment in, in, in the wake of COVID-19 because um, that they can't meet as they would do normally, they can't receive arguments as they would do normally. And so having this procedure, which is scrutinized by an insolvency practitioner and doesn't require rely on a court decision, that can be um, quite useful. One of the problems with administration, however, are the two problems that um, one is that its reputation has suffered in recent years. The reason why its reputation has suffered is because in a lot of cases, administration was found to be too expensive for companies during their lifetimes. And um, as a result, the, um, as a result, the, administration was used in lots of cases to achieve a sale of the company's business rather than as administration had originally been envisaged to do um, to facilitate a period of ongoing trading so originally it was designed so that the company would operate for up to a year under the control of the insolvency practitioner to figure out what what to do in more recent years it's been used to affect what's called a prepack where the company's underlying business is uh, immediately sold upon the company entering administration. And um, so um, it had come to be regarded effectively as a liquidation procedure. And obviously that's not what's uh, desirable in the current scenario because you have companies that are viable in normal times. Uh, that are using administration to gain protection at the moment. And um, the insolvency profession is doing a lot to try and 
um, restore the reputation of administration as a rescue procedure. Um, so I think it's administration that will play the, the key role because of that moratorium protecting companies. Um, the question, will credit bidding be allowed during the moratorium period? That would be part of the restructuring plan. Um, I, I think so. I'd, I'm not aware of any case testing that point, but um, I, I, would have, I would have thought that um, it, it, it could um, be a means of um, dealing with restructurings. Uh, I'm not sure what the question, can we have a common law at the global level for uniform practice um, relates to? I, I, uh, taking one view of, of that, I think ultimately that's where we need to get to, given the way that business is changing. Um, technology means that um, business, businesses, countries are becoming interconnected. So you have things like the internet, you have things like cloud computing. And um, I think because of that, it's desirable that means should start to develop where uh, insolvencies are dealt with on a global level. I think there's a lot of progress that is needed. And um, it's, it's, but, but therefore, it's something um, that, that we should be work, working towards. And dealing briefly with the two other um, insolvency procedures. So the company voluntary arrangement is a more simple procedure. And it doesn't normally come with a moratorium, although small companies can obtain that. And it provides a framework for reaching an agreement with creditors. So um, debts can be restructured um, through, uh, through majority agreement of creditors, 75% in value. Uh, but because it's not got a moratorium, that wouldn't be the starting point for, for many companies. And um, the, the third is not, a, it's technically not an insolvency procedure, um, but um, it's a scheme of arrangement, which I think you should be familiar with in, in India. You know, you've probably got some similar laws. And that has been a successful means of restructuring large companies. It's not a procedure which is particularly well suited for the current economic climate because it relies heavily on the courts. That you have a court hearing to call a meeting to consider the proposals. You have uh, meetings of accreditors and members after that. And then you have another court meeting to confirm what has been agreed. Um, I think in the long, longer term, schemes of arrangement can be useful for restructuring, but the infrastructure isn't um, there to support those at the moment. So criticisms of the existing procedures. Uh, one of those is that they're not particularly well suited to small and medium enterprises. Um, it was noted that um, Uh, I noticed earlier that uh, what we'll, the M SME here is micro, small and medium enterprises. Um, they're the bulk of companies in the UK. But um, the insolvency procedures, in particular administration, tends to be too expensive for them. And I think in the longer term, we'll need to look at how those sorts of business can be supported. Um, I think globally, attention needs to be paid to this issue. Uh, making sure that there are relatively cheap and effective means for micro, small and medium enterprises to restructure. Um, the other problem, I touched upon this to some extent, is that there is a lack of an option for larger companies or a lack of an option for companies to obtain a moratorium without losing control to an insolvency practitioner. The thinking in administration is that companies can obtain a moratorium, 
but you need to have an insolvency practitioner in control because they know what they're doing. They are used to handling restructurings. And um, there has been evident in the UK system to some extent, a lack of trust of company directors. What it also, I think, uh, depends on is because um, the level of court control over administration procedures has been reduced and um, you need insolvency practitioner involvement uh, to scrutinize the viability of in administration applications and uh, insolvency practitioners can provide that. Uh, some of these questions that are coming through are quite um, quite long. It's difficult for me to, um, to to figure them out. So I'll I'll deal with some of these towards the the end. So I'll look at uh, what has been done in relation to, um, uh, in particular, helping directors, because the situation we're faced in at the moment is good managers who are running companies very well, profitable, viable companies are all of a sudden facing difficulties and you, you don't need to replace those directors. They're perfectly capable of handling the, handling the case. They don't need an insolvency practitioner to, um, to, to gain control. And what the insolvency pr profession in the UK has um, devised as an appropriate solution is to have an agreement during administration that the company will go into administration and the insolvency practitioner will agree that the existing directors retain control. So they don't need the insolvency practitioner running things. Um, the protocol authorizes the directors to uh, retain control. And um, that means that administration is more adaptable, that uh, it means that viable companies can obtain the protection of a moratorium and can retain control as well. And um, so I think that's a positive development. What we also have is some, um, so in the, the PowerPoint that will be available to you, there are some links the words that are underlined are linked to relevant documents um, where you can read about what the, the UK laws are. Um, we've got some new procedures coming in. Um, rather than these having been miraculously thought up by the government in the last month, it's something that they have been considering for at least 10 years. It's, um, it was um, mentioned um, when I was first a professor, and uh, it's been revived relatively recently, that um, there was a consultation in 2016 about the um, development of some new insolvency procedures. And um, these were announced in August 2018, so long before coronavirus hit, as forthcoming. It was said that these procedures would be introduced when legislative time allowed. Now, of course, you might be aware that in the UK, um, the UK is in a process of leaving the European Union. And um, that has occupied a lot of legislative time during the time before coronavirus. And that meant that these insolvency procedures were delayed, but um, they are now being fast-tracked as reforms. And it's anticipated that they will come in next week. So one of these is a self-standing moratorium that companies now wouldn't need to um, go into administration in order to obtain a moratorium. Um, and um, that will enable companies to, to get the help that they need. There will also be a restructuring plan, which is similar to the scheme of arrangement but includes the possibility for the court to cram down and um, approve a plan uh, in spite of the, the, the objections of 
one of the classes of impaired creditors. Um, the reform proposals will also um, ensure the continuation of supply arrangements. So contractual provisions which allow for the termination of supply in cases where the company is insolvent um, will not be effective. So companies that are in um, uh, difficulties, which are in administration, will still be able to obtain ongoing supplies. And that will be important for things like um, shops and um, online uh, businesses selling clothes because many uh, clothes shops aren't able to trade normally. Um, the main piece of legislation so far has been the Coronavirus Act to, uh, 2020, which is um, passed in March. And um, that helps directors, first of all, by funding sick pay, so people who get ill during and can't work due to coronavirus, the government will cover the sick pay, which must be paid to them. And um, there are also restrictions on landlords, so they can't exercise powers of forfeiture, um, which is important to protect companies um, that um, aren't getting income from uh, their, their businesses. Um, of course, there are impacts on landlords, so uh, in insolvencies, um, problems are often multidimensional, but in, in this scenario, it was felt that um, there had to be restrictions on forfeitures so, so that companies could survive. Um, a couple of questions have related to the next point, and um, there hasn't been any formal government decision to this effect. Um, so there's no general moratorium on, on companies, for example. It has, it's something that individual companies need to apply for, either through administration or through the new moratorium procedure. So not all companies will have that. But all companies effectively are protected because normally a company would enter winding up as a result of, for example, a creditor petition. And during the current period, the courts are ill-equipped to handle those petitions. And so as a matter of practicality, winding up petitions have had to be adjourned. Winding up is a serious matter which needs proper discussion. And that can't happen in the current scenario. So um, the, the courts, as a matter of policy, have deferred the hearing of winding up petitions uh, until the, I think the end of June. So um, it's not that we've got a general moratorium, rather it's for individual companies to seek protection. And the main threat to companies, which is a winding up petition, um, has been neutralized by this adjournment. Uh, winding up does need a court decision and um, it, it needs proper hearing. Um, so I think that's a, a couple of the, the, the questions uh, relate to general suspension. Um, I think the approach of the courts is, is going to be um, to be restrictive as to winding up, but supportive as to um, administration and the, the new moratorium. Uh, in particular because administration can be obtained without a court decision, merely through filing documents with the court um, in cases where an insolvency practitioner considers that uh, an administration appointment is um, going to achieve desired objectives. And then the other measure that supports directors is suspension of wrongful trading liabilities. Um, this is part of the discussions at European level, I think. I think it's influenced by this. In some European countries, you have a law where directors are liable if they fail to file for insolvency proceedings. The UK doesn't have that. Um, we don't have anything as strict as that. 
Um, so you've seen in uh, many continental European countries a uh, reform where those liabilities for directors are removed during this period when um, coronavirus was, was hitting. Um, the difficulty for directors of viable companies would be knowing how long disruption will continue for, and um, this will help them. Um, so just to look at wrongful trading, what this entails, because it's slightly different from the continental European approach of liability for failure to file. And um, arguably, the step which was taken um, by the government to suspend these liabilities may not have been necessary. So wrongful trading is a civil liability that enables a director to be ordered to pay sums to compensate creditors. That is in cases where the company's in liquidation or administration and they knew or ought to have concluded that there is no reasonable prospect of in, avoiding insolvent liquidation. So this is aimed at the director who uh, does nothing, who knows that the company's in difficulties and hopes that the problem will go away and fails to file as a result. And um, that tends to result in greater losses to creditors than would otherwise have been the case. Um, dealing with Ovashi's question on um, the defense of business judgment rule. So in the UK, we don't have um, the business judgment rule as such, we have equivalent, functional equivalent. And within wrongful trading, the equivalent is, is this, that a director will have a defense if they took every step with a view to minimizing the potential loss to the company's creditors. So that provides directors who are diligent with a defense. And arguably, it would have been preferable that rather than suspending wrongful trading for three months, that instead directors would have to rely on this defense. That would force them to show that they took proper steps, they considered all of the possibilities, and um, they did what they could to minimize losses to creditors. So, I, I, I would be inclined to agree that we didn't need um, the suspension of wrongful trading because undoubtedly there will be some who um, fall below the standard that you would expect of a fit director. Um, that said, there are various other grounds for liability that remain, and one of those is director disqualification. So arguably, directors who show during um, administration or during the moratorium that they are unfit to be company directors, they will remain um, possible subjects for direct disqualification. That hasn't been suspended. Uh, similarly, fraudulent trading hasn't been suspended and the transaction avoidance laws have not been suspended. So there are many grounds for um, liability um, still and um, we should not therefore, so the post is just arriving, so if you've got um, background noises, um, that's, uh, that's that. Uh, so there are other uh, grounds for liability still, and therefore we perhaps shouldn't make too much of this suspension being something that will undermine the protection of creditors. Uh, rather, there will still be ways in which directors can be um, made liable. Um, obviously, insolvency practitioners are facing a difficult time. Uh, under administration, they play a very key role. And um, the, the professional bodies, this is a um, highly regulated profession of uh, experienced, well-trained, and um, well-trained well professionals who have 
uh, financial um, underpinning in, in the form of a bond and insurance. Um, they have professional bodies which have a disciplinary role if, if, for example, they miss deadlines. The professional bodies have said that during the time of coronavirus, because that can make it difficult for, de for insolvency practitioners to comply with deadlines, inevitably there will be some that slip through the cracks. They will look at that leniently and um, they will also enable insolvency practitioners who are distributing insolvency estates. Um, normally, they're expected to do that fairly promptly, but um, it felt that distributing an estate, an estate during the coronavirus crisis um, may result in lower returns than would other be the case, otherwise be the case. And um, so as a result, insolvency practitioners are able to delay credited payments until such time as the, the markets have recovered. Um, now I mentioned that administration, because of the way that it operates, uh, means that um, appointments can be made without a court order. Whereas in contrast, winding up does need a court order and those hearings are delayed. Um, but for, if administration is to run smoothly, insolvency practitioners are finding that they need guidance as to how some of the new government measures fit in alongside the existing laws. So things like retention of employees, how does that fit in with um, administration? And there have been a couple of cases uh, addressing particular points of uh, English law. And um, I don't propose to uh, go into the technicalities of those because they rely on some um, complications. But you can have um, the, the there are links to the the, the the cases if you want to have a look at those. Um, what I wanted to focus on was the role of the courts. That because these cases were presenting crucial issues, and uh, in the Carluccio's case. Um, the, the point was neatly described. It was said that the COVID-19 pandemic is a critical situation which carries serious risks to the economy and jobs in addition to the obvious dangers to health. I think that it's right that wherever possible, the court should work constructively together with the insolvency pr profession to implement the government's unprecedented response to crisis in a similarly innovative manner. So you have insolvency practitioners who are faced with uncertainties as to how the law works and who are not wanting to risk personal liability for acting in a way that turns out to be contrary to the law. So what they've been doing is applying to the courts for directions. And the courts haven't been entirely happy about issuing directions in such circumstances because they um, will be used to having a full hearing that a full hearing is desirable, that you should have arguments on both sides. Whereas in both of these cases, um, there weren't, for example, these were cases that concerned employees. There was no representation from employees. Um, there were only arguments from the administrators. In spite of that, the courts thought it important to directions um, in order that these um, administrations could uh, could continue. Um, so it's not an ideal way of carrying out um, carrying out uh, decisions, issuing directions. But I think it's important to support insolvency practitioners where possible by providing certainty in the law. Okay, so that was the. What I wanted to cover, the main points about the UK response, and in particular, how the insolvency laws have been adapted, how insolvency practitioners um, have responded. And I'll just deal with the remaining questions. I think I've dealt with most of them during the, um, 
um, during the discussion, but um, I'll deal with any others now as well. Um, Pre-packed. Um, I think the issue that we have at the moment is that the companies that are going into administration uh, in many cases are viable and um, what they need is an ongoing period of trading with protection from creditors and they, they can continue as companies um, in their present format. Um, in administration normally a lot of the companies are ones that aren't particularly viable in normal circumstances if a company is in difficulties it will enter into negotiations with creditors outside of the insolvency framework and um, in, in process which is commonly known as a workout or sometimes referred to as an informal restructuring. So it's a contract-based um, approach, and that can work well for viable companies in normal times. So the ones in normal circumstances end up in administration are often ones that aren't particularly viable, and that is why prepacks have tended to be popular. One reason why prepacks have tended to be popular the other reason is that um, administration is often um, expensive and um, not suitable for um, companies that, um, in particular, small and medium com companies. Uh, so should pre-packs be used as a tool now to force businesses to change their business plans, rework financial projections, restructure debts and av avail one-time bridge finance at the same time allowing the same directors to continue and um, it depends on the circumstances in some cases that is going to be um, important uh, in some cases companies that enter administration during the coronavirus crisis are ones that aren't viable and um, they should be candidates for liquidation they should, shouldn't have their lives art artificially prolonged just simply because um, the means to do that are available. Um, so the, the, the question on pre-packs, should they be used as a tool, allowing the same directors to continue? Yes, if the directors are competent. Um, no, if the directors aren't. Um, but that depends on, as I say, whether the company would have been viable uh, outside of uh, the current, current crisis. Um, suggested amendments for a country like India. Um, it's difficult for me to answer because um, you, you have expertise in India, and I think you'll be the best placed people to to decide that. Um, I think some of the um, approaches that I've discussed in relation to the UK could perhaps be adapted by. Adapted by India, but um, I think the UK approach heavily rests on the expertise of insolvency practitioners, and um, so it depends on what institutions you have in India and um, what capacity there is to to deal with those. And uh, it, yeah, that's not something that I would um, know enough about India to be able to. I think I dealt with most of the questions. Yeah, uh, I yeah. think you've got most of the yeah. questions, Professor. Um, just uh, there are a few questions uh, that uh, I also had. In, uh, you talked about COVID nine uh, COVID nineteen act that UK has uh, passed. Uh, so yeah. much to do with it. Yeah. Uh, uh, does it defer the obligations uh, of part uh, of uh, participants, or does it suspend, or does it, for example, in the in Singapore, uh, you know, the tenants' uh, obligation to pay is only deferred, uh, but tenants, uh, but uh, landlords can still set off their claims. 
So I'm just curious to know how, how does law treat that in the UK? Um, that will be dealt with in the details of the Coronavirus Act and I've, I've not um, looked at that particular matter in detail. Um, the, the main focus that I had was on the um, suspension of the powers to forfeit. So it's, um, landlords can't um, end leases. And I, I, I would have to uh, check the details of the the act to to know um, further details about the um, the payment of rent, for example. Uh, also, I had a question on, uh, 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 you know, wrongful trading. Do you think the, uh, there's a new safe harbor for directors now? Is it uh, a, it, sorry. A, does it create new safe harbor for directors to, uh, uh, you know, through this uh, new laws that is suspended the wrongful uh, trading as, uh, as an uh, obligation? And... Uh, so, for instance, like Australia has given some directions that only in certain circumstances will be exonerated from the obligations, but not in all circumstances. So, do you have such guidelines in the UK also, or um, is the generalistic um, approach that courts have taken? Not so far as I'm aware. Not so far. Um, there'll be different approaches, and the UK approach has just been this suspension of wrongful trading liabilities. Um, but there, there is plenty of advice for directors out there from professionals. That's very useful. I would request the viewers uh, to ask any questions that they have. If you have any further questions, you may write in the chat box. Or you could also use the microphone below. You can switch it on and uh, ask your questions. I think from my perspective, the chat um, would work most uh, helpfully because the audio doesn't always come through very well. So as I see that uh, there are no more questions. Uh, um, one more. One more. Oh, there's one more, yes. Um, companies that were already in difficulties. Um, it depends really on um, the, the situation of each company. But um, th th there's an example, for example, um, of a department store that was in difficulties uh, a, a few months ago that entered administration and restructured um, the agreements with its landlords. So a department store with many units. That is now in administration again due to coronavirus. But one would have to wonder how viable that company actually is and um, whether um, it, uh, it it should continue. Um, so the basic probable effect um, if, if Companies that were already in insolvency proceedings because they weren't, weren't viable um, uh, so that, that, that as I say they they shouldn't um, have their lives artificially prolonged due to uh, the, the coronavirus um, in in a longer term, one of the functions of insolvency is to eliminate weaker companies so that the more stronger companies can can prosper and uh, in in the long term. You would want a market-based system of insolvency laws to achieve that. Um, inevitably, I think as a result of the coronavirus, you're going to have companies that would have left the market in other circumstances continuing. But um, that's just something that um, I, 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 I think that's, that's inevitable. So there was so there was one more. Uh, suspending insolvency provisions on asset value. Um, 
That's not something I've particularly looked at. Um, if you keep companies going rather than liquidating them, assets tend to have a greater value if they're kept collectively. So I would have thought that suspending, winding up ultimately is a value preserving measure. I think that was the final question. Yeah. Uh, so uh, thank you to all our viewers who uh, who lo logged in for the webinar today. And uh, Professor Perry, special thanks to you, because uh, despite of the time difference, you agreed to do this uh, webinar at a short notice. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to share with all the participants that Professor Perry has some very specialist, uh, you know, knowledge and interest in, uh, uh, you know, uh, cloud computing insolvency and technology insolvency, which we do look forward to hearing from you at some other occasion. Thank you so much, Professor Perry. Uh, thanks to my wonderful team who's been working uh, uh, in the background. Uh, Urvashi, who is a senior research fellow with the Center for Insolvency and Bankruptcy. Mr. Abhijit who is the IT, uh, uh, you know, from the IT department and uh, who has arranged all this. And to the wonderful viewers who joined us uh, today. And uh, we do hope to see you all soon again. Thank you, Professor Perry. Just for the viewers Thank to you. let you know, we are doing, uh, we're doing another round of seminar next Friday. So see you around lunchtime next Friday. Thank you so much. Thank you.